So, of course, I myself couldn't stick to the 20 slides minute, so I think I have 77 slides, so we'll see how it goes. I'm still cutting you off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, please do it. Okay, so at Software Studies Initiative here, you know, we are quite excited to work on a number of projects, and uh, you know, you'll hear about some of them. And today I'm going to talk about one of these projects, which in some ways presents, let's say, a mirror, right? A mirror face of software studies, as we already heard about it so far, which is uh, bringing approaches from you know, design, humanities, cultural criticism, and all the other fields to think about software. So what we also want to do, and that's, let's say, the mirror face of so software studies, the way we understand it, is to apply software and software-enabled so research methods, tools, and paradigms to study culture itself in new ways. So I'm going to talk about a kind of broad research initiative uh, called cultural analytics. Okay, so you can think of cultural analytics as extrapolation and intersection of seven contemporary vectors. First is data explosion. Uh, by 2011, the size of the digital universe is going to be 10 times larger than today, so that's approximately 60% growth every year. Okay. The second is one of the attempts to deal with this ongoing quest to tame, monetize, extract knowledge from, and make sense of information. Uh, 20 years ago, around 87, 80, in 88, 87, 88, NSF has funded a new field of scientific visualization. Right? Uh, global visualization of kind of global ocean flows or simulation of uh, 19 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Now, what we also have seen in the last 10 years or 12 years is massive attempts to digitize existing cultural assets, right? Think about, for example, Google Books or Art Store, a large project funded by Mellon Foundation where we went to all the different slide libraries and digitized their slides. Uh, and from what I understand, our own slide library at UCD library is getting, getting rid of our slides like right now. So our historians in our department are going to come, you know, take the boxes and bring them to our studios and kind of preserve them for, for entirety, but everybody else is going to use art store. Four, beginning, this is more recent development, beginning around, let's say, 2002, 2000, maybe 2004, rise of social media, which I would briefly define as user-generated content plus user conversations and other activities, you know, search and so on around this content. And of course, since all this content and user activity around this content are in digital format, they can be understood as data which can be mined and graphed, right? So beginnings of cultural analytics can be already discerned in tools such as Google Trends and more industrial, let's say, quality Right? Tools such as Blog Pulse from Nielsen. And we give you a little demo, so I advise you to go to Blog Pulse and play with it. It's quite amazing. And of course, if you're a company, you can pay them. And we're saying here that, you know, we're looking at um, 80 million blogs, you know, every day. And if your company will tell you exactly what people around the world are saying about your company and critiquing your brands or liking a particular model. So this is companies already beginning to take advantage of all this digital content. And this is a project by uh, Golan Levin, Dumpster, which analyzes, which can use exactly the same technology which his friend working for GM has gave him. So it's basically we crawled the web and we uh, selected 100,000 blog posts where people are talking about breakups and it's interactive visualizations of these breakups. Of course, it only artists would think about doing projects about people breaking up for Valentine's Day. Right. Five. Well, with all the excitement about the growth of amateur content, what people maybe haven't discussed as much, if at all, is similar exponential development, but on a smaller scale, a growth, what I would call, of a global professional cultural universe. Right? This is uh, from uh, 2005, all the, fashion, all the fashion weeks around the world. And of course, if you put all the art biennales, you know, the map will become invisible. Uh, Right. Architects, students, designers, filmmakers, cultural producers in right, dozens of countries have access to the same ideas, the same information, the same tools. As a result, we often come up with the same aesthetic solutions. Zaha Hadid, designed for a museum in Dubai, 
Zaha Hadid designed for, uh, for the towers in Dubai. Both have been built now. And this is uh, from uh, Mad Architects, the first Chinese architect firm which started to build abroad. This is their project for uh, Kunsthalle in uh, uh, Norway. And sorry, not Norway, so in Denmark. And this is a villa in Denmark we're also building. Um, and again, this is the image I already showed, the examples of, right, with these tools are really omnipresent and they're available everywhere. Uh, young students at the Design Week in Singapore, young students at the Design Biennale in Shanghai. Now, this, new, this newly globalized and expanded global professional culture also leaves lots of digital traces, and therefore it can be followed through its online presence. One of my favorite sites is Colorflot, which collects portfolios of students from around the world, so you can go over and take a look at 90, over 90,000 portfolios. And if you look at the people who are submitting these portfolios, I mean, you can really see the cultural globalization in effect. Shanghai, New York, uh, Seoul, and so on and so forth. Similar, similar kind of aggregation site for student work. Seven, visualization in the last, let's say, few years, maybe last 10 years, has moved from being a tool to a new cultural form. So go quickly. Visualization becomes visible, right? It's included in the, let's say, current exhibition design of Elastic Mind at MoMA. We see the last three years, visualization has replacing public, you know, sculpture, public art in one of the most new prestigious cultural spaces, Seattle Public Library, uh, AAC building by Frangeri in New York, uh, New York Times building in New York, and this is uh, Volkswagen Autostad in Germany, where the whole presentation of the company is done through 16 interactive visualization screens. Visualization, visualization becomes art. And of course, since all this data is available, people have started to visualize cultural patterns. So we have a growing number of projects, right, in what I would call culture visualization. This is, by the way, this is a conversation in a movie, right, visualized. Uh, this is Jack Karayak on the road, visualization of an artistic structure. So we have seven trends. Where do these trends, where do the seven trends meet? Right. Welcome to cultural analytics, which is basically just simply our extrapolation, right, of these trends. And we can define it as analysis and visualization of very large cultural data sets. Wouldn't you want to visualize global cultural patterns? Analyze long tales of cultural production? Visualize cultural changes over time, whether it is in European Renaissance art or in music styles today or anything else? Map a shift from a flat world to inverted world. Inverted world is the term I'm trying to sort of think about where in the last five years the so-called developing countries has overtaking the developed countries. Mapping cultural flows which do not leave digital traces very important. And of course, we can also do it in the classroom, right, where the students can come up with data in one class, and then in another class, we can come and, and visualize this data. So what we're, going to build at, what we're going to build at Software Studies Initiative, and we already got initial funding from ECSD, is the Open Cultural Analytics Research Environment, right? That's the display it's going to run on. It happens to be the largest television display in the world right now, but I'm sure it will be overtaking you know, in the next 10 seconds. So you'll, those of you who are coming on tour will see it on uh, Thursday. Inspired by visual analytics environments as using military, you know, operation control, and so on. And also uh, map of science type of research. So this is three mockups we designed with uh, our students. So that's what we're going to start building this summer. So in this case, you know, you see the whole world and you see different trends. And let's say if you don't select anything, these graphs may maybe show you for example, you know, music, architecture, you know, fashion, software, media. And when you start zooming in and selecting particular areas, these graphs will be updated, right? And then what you're seeing on the right is the actual two objects, right? So we're using the ability of computer to kind of zoom in and out and to go from a global map onto the particular features of particular objects. So the idea is to be able to understand the global culture, or at least as much of it as leaves digital traces. And if it doesn't leave digital traces, figure out a ways how to capture this information and see this being contest. So this is perhaps the inverted world, right? This is perhaps trying to think about culture which doesn't leave digital traces. This will be, uh, let's say, a kind of uh, popularity long tail map, or perhaps 
the historical development of different cultural trends over time. And finally, this is the most exciting, taking the idea from map of science, this can be a map of connections between features of books, magazines, you know, software projects, media art projects, and anything else, right? Again, be able to look at the large body of cultural material and analyze it the way, let's say, biologists looking at evolutions or, uh, uh, you know, ecological areas. Uh, so that's it. Thank you.